great to be here. As you heard, my name is Wayne Godwin, and I lead JLL's Hotels and Hospitality Group for, for Africa. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's fantastic to be able to move the spotlight a little bit west to those 54 countries that make up Africa, uh, where one in four people will, will live by 2050. And, and of course, a really central and important part of the overall Middle East and Africa investment narrative, right? So, so I think that's really what we're here to discuss. You know, we can all appreciate the similarities, but also some differences between uh, that Africa offers versus the Middle East. Um, but everyone has their own sort of investment thesis and questions to ask around the opportunity for Africa. And I'm delighted to be joined by my panel here today, who really, you know, we, we, we're gonna try to answer these, these questions honestly and openly, and obviously would encourage some input from the, the audience later on. So without further ado, I'll int introduce Ewan Cameron, who leads Westmont Hospitality Group for Africa. Um, we've got Johari Roger Sefe, uh, who's from the Ministry of Tourism in Madagascar, and Michael Parnell, Managing P Partner for Valor. So thank you very much, gents. We'll get straight into it. Michael, starting with you. So we're obviously very much in that, uh, well, we, the, the recovery is well underway. We've heard about that all week. Um, how is Africa comparing and keeping pace versus both the other regions where you're, you're present, but also expectations that, that, that the sector held. Yep. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, good question, Wayne. I mean, obviously, the way I look at Africa, as you mentioned at the beginning, 54 countries. So yeah. there's a different story, probably, for each of those 54. Uh, in the same way as the Middle East is not just yeah. about Dubai. Obviously, there's, there's sleepier places in the Middle East. but. But I think in general, Africa has uh, now um, come realized after probably a, slowest, a slower rebound out of COVID than elsewhere in the world. Um, and I think we're very optimistic now. This last 12 months has been really, really uh, very positive and very active for us. And just chatting to you, and I know the same uh, for him. Um, and a lot of the macro issues f that affect hotels, clearly air, you know, air, d air uh, connections, uh, you know, which countries were going through political challenges uh, this last couple of years as well, maybe moved past some big elections the last year. So we're very positive, uh, very, very positive. There's certain markets that will do better, mm -hmm. clearly. Yeah. Um, but all, all around it, mm. I mean, it's a very positive story. We're very yeah. glad that we're there. And I think that's probably pretty central, right? That it is not a homogenous story. You know, a decade, 15 years ago, you could broadly sort of paint some macro kind of trends at a country level or regional level. Now it's quite different, even at a sort of street corner level, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, they'd say, you know, again, location, location, location. Mm. So there's certain mm. very hot spots within a particular country, within a particular city. Yep. Um, and I think the other thing to make comment about is that the, the, there are far more brands now present, you know, this mm. now than there were, let's say, 10 years ago. Yep. Um, so I think the market's maturing. Yep. Um, I think the regional travel sure. uh, through really sub-Saharan Africa is, our, yep. is really our focus. Um, I never knew when we entered the market that so much of the business that we do in our hotels would be regional. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's, that's really fascinating. And, and, and that, that maturity of a bigger middle class yeah. um, who not just need to travel for business, but actually want to go and explore mm -hmm. you know, natural beauty of, of, of Africa in its abundance. Well, well, I mean, I think that's an excellent segue because when you talk natural beauty, I mean, I've I think if anyone has had the opportunity to explore Madagascar, I mean, an incredible <laughs> location that has come onto the investor radar maybe the last 10 years or so. Um, but I guess, like it, the rest of the world and certainly emerging markets, has had its own challenges through this COVID period. How do you see that sort of journey over the last 10 years and the particularly the headwinds we're facing globally in terms of attracting investment for tourism and hospitality? Um, good afternoon, everyone, and I'm uh, um, very pleased to, to be here, part of uh, this panel. Uh, actually, um, for all its uh, history in uh, tourism, 
Madagascar has uh, welcomed the maximum brands, I mean international brands, during the last decade, as you mentioned before. Uh, the pandemic was had more impact on uh, attracting tourists to come to Madagascar, like uh, all other countries, but not really in terms of investment. Mm. Because during the, the pandemic, just before or right after that, we 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 opened some um, brands in Madagascar, uh, either from uh, international or locally also. Uh, but the, the 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 most common for all these projects are they are all uh, made by local investors. So that's why the the pandemic has not really had mm. a big impact on investment yep. in Madagascar. But before that, just before the the crisis, we organized a forum, investment mm. forum in Madagascar, where we we had many um, uh, uh, interests from uh, from uh, foreign investors. Mm -hmm. But the, the problem, this is the only problem that we got from the, the pandemic because they yep. could not. Uh, realize the, yes, yeah. the, the project. But, but uh, as I said, uh, in terms of investment, it has not really had a big impact mm -hmm. on uh, oh, that's fantastic the hospitality. Yeah. And I think probably testament to the scale of the country, the scenic beauty, the natural product. Um, so that's fantastic. And better airlift as well in the last few years as well. Ewan, talk, switching to you, and obviously this is an investment conference, and, and I think one of the big parts of Africa, I mean, it's, it's, you know, probably more liquid from a transactional perspective than, than people realize, and, and, and certainly uh, the Middle East, uh, historically. Um, but, but in terms of big investors coming into the region and looking for scale and depth from if they're institutions that aren't going to sort of just come in and want to do a $20 million acquisition. They actually want scale and depth to take them through. I mean, what is your perspective on this, the, the ability to assemble it, the existence of it, and, and the importance of it, or not? Th thanks, Wayne, and, and good afternoon. Um, it's a good question, because we've, we've had this internal yep. discussion, if you like, Wayne. You know, Westmont Hospitality is amongst the largest private owners of hotel real estate globally. Today, we have more than 500 assets uh, those assets are generally internationally branded, and we operate as well as we have uh, an equity position. So we're, we're owners and we're operators. Yep. So GLL know as well, when we've moved into most markets, we've done it through the acquisition of portfolios. Yep. Portfolios help us to spread risk, may, may mean we can achieve scale relatively quickly, and it then helps us to de-risk those investment um, returns. Africa was different for us. So when we did our analysis, we found it really difficult to identify the scalability of buying a portfolio. And as Michael said, it's not just one mass market, it's made up of different yeah, yeah. Uh, countries, but more importantly to us, it's down to even cities and even postal code level. Um, so what we've been doing since 2015 is acquiring key assets. So we've gone into Maputo, we've gone quite considerably into Nairobi in recent times, and we've done that with joint venture partners. So we've been bringing in institutional capital, which has found it difficult in the past to come in, but because the partner with Westmont enables us to unlock that institutional still investor. And then secondly, as we move probably into, I hope, the second chapter. So you could say that Westmont and probably another two or three players might be regarded as, as first movers. Yep. So mm. the hotel real estate market is moving from individual owners to more maybe regional portfolios mm. and even now we hope maybe pan-African portfolios. Mm -hmm. And then as an international investor, you're looking in and going, how do they manage that, mm. that risk? And yep. then secondly, how do they use different brands to unlock those key markets? Yeah, mm. and I guess that's, that's when you talk about those sort of first movers, of course, a lot of the capital is actually local and regional capital uh, within, you know, private families, high net worths, but, but it's a proxy for the, the big international players that you're talking about, that the benchmark and the, the roadmap is being laid now by these sort of formative players. And, and I guess the, the w what are some of the benefits to that, right? It's liquidity. So everyone benefits from that spotlight from some of those bigger, bigger investors, right? It, 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 you're, you're absolutely right. 
So we, we did a joint venture with Actus. Now, Actus yeah. are the largest real estate um, private equity investor in Africa today. So they have high exposure to residential, considerable exposure to, to retail, some industry, and now moving more into healthcare um, and into energy. When they wanted to come into the hospitality space, the joint venture of us, to your very point, yep. they had some knowledge of the tax regimes, the mm. uh, accessing debt across the continent, but what Westmont could do is, is really help them with regard to, and it's granular, how do you structure yourself in Kenya to make sure you're compliant, but also to make sure that you're not losing cash to the tax system unnecessarily, for instance. Mm -hmm. Secondly, what does an exit look like? You know, those questions need yep. to come at the beginning of an investment thesis, not at the end of a thesis. Mm -hmm. And we were able, through our experience in all the markets, to demonstrate to your point, mm -hmm. maybe behind us you'll have more institutional investors coming in who are looking to take those takeoffs. but what do they want to buy? So we mm -hmm. then looked at what we've done in Europe and then did the same, if you like, in Africa. Have the right yep. local teams and marry yeah, that with yeah. the, right, the right global appetite. Yeah, exactly, and I think what's, what's quite interesting for us is that it, you know, that hospitality story sort of then it's pervasive into other asset classes as well. You know, so whether it's actors to PE that are agnostic to asset class, um, but hotels are relatively liquid in the bigger portion from our, of real estate transactions within Africa. So I think it's that overall real estate story that we, we're looking to, to, to tell to get that, those big institutional players um, into the region. But, but talking well, about so owners, now I'll come Wayne, to you, but yeah, go for it. Just to make a comment. Um, mm. You know, one thing that I see as a huge opportunity for, for Africa developments as well is where you, you, you start to look at these mixed-use yeah. developments where it's not just a hotel play, it's not just a retail or a commercial office play. It, it, it's, it's a combination mm -hmm. which spreads risk, has a different, you know, uh, mm. forward-looking attribute about yep. it. We've seen it obviously elsewhere in the world. Um, and I think whilst that that will not be for all investors, yeah, the fact sure. of the matter is there's, there's other, uh, so I'm excited about sure. that. I mean, they always said about uh, Africa that you know, the technology, um, the latest technology into countries that didn't have technology <laughs> in the first place, they skip they skip a, a need sure, because sure, they sure. go straight to the to the to the to the, to the, to the wireless solution. technology or, mm. or whatever it is. So, and I think the same goes with some of these property players. Yeah, you know, sometimes they are behind Middle East or they are behind mm -hmm. a, a lot of first world um, you know countries, but they can pick the best as to what's absolutely working there, and emulate that back in uh, back yeah. in Africa and get more bang for their buck. No, I think that's absolutely true, and you must be seeing it now in terms of the owners that have gone through a tough patch. I mean, we all understand how difficult COVID has been, but now the recovery is there. But, you know, obviously, the, the, they're going to be reticent. At the, our memories aren't that short, right? So, I mean, what is part of the, the story as an operator in terms of getting comfort back to owners? I mean, there's obviously the mixed-use piece and, and the extent to which blur, the bl lines have blurred within hospitality where, I mean, we heard it on the, the, the stage earlier that, you know, it's all kind of amalgamating into one that it's no longer really sort of just about the bed. It's that overall experience. But I mean, how are you yeah. seeing African owners, uh, you know, uh, react to this? Um, look, I think, again, it depends owner to owner, right? There's the sophisticated ones who are well-traveled. They've yeah. seen a lot that they that they want to replicate in some way, shape or form for their developments. And then there's very naive uh, owners who've almost fallen into the hotel yep. game because it, it kind of came their way with an opportunity. Um, so it's a different solution for all. But, uh, but, uh, but I think what I was making the point about the mixed use is just what Valor have brought to, I think brought to the table is because we're not a brand. So we're not defined by four walls and a roof that's a, that's got to be a global standard of a, of a particular uh, uh, brand. You know, we can look in a far more dynamic yep. way. Mm. And if it makes sense to have uh, apartments with your hotel or co-working space with your hotel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, or a lot of high street food and beverage in your hotel or with associated with your hotel, yep. that's our sweet spot. Yep. Whereas I think a lot of the international brands, and it's not a criticism, it's, it's just the observation They'll mm -hmm. come in, it's rooms, it's traditional banquet rooms yeah. like this, 
it's two restaurants, it's an all day down. And, and is that future proofing yeah. what Africa really needs? Ex exactly. And, 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 right. I, and, and I think, and we, we've just opened uh, you know, a Hilton uh, in, in Kinshasa, and the owner there is very much about the fact that there's a huge amount of uh, local business for yeah. that hotel to, to capture because there's a lot of affluent people in, mm -hmm. in a city that has very little offering, quite yeah. honestly, from a, from a food and beverage point of mm -hmm. view, let's say. Um, so you can capture that market. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, in general, our view is just maximizing every square meter of the, yeah. of the property. And even if that means doing non-traditional hotel things, it might actually bring mm. a lot of revenue and a lot of USPs for that yeah. property. Yeah, I, I like the points around the local travel because, I mean, that is really sort of the big opportunity uh, for Africa when you've got this huge, rapidly uh, growing population, urbanizing, youth travel, exposed to technology. They will, will travel, you know. It's the infrastructure is improving, whether it's airlift, et cetera, to unlock it. Not maybe at the pace we would like, uh, certain factors like visas, et cetera, but, but it's generally a good story. But I think th we obviously also know that Africa has an incredible product, tourism product to offer the world. Jahari, and I want to touch on that with you. As, an, as a tourism promotion agency, I mean, how important is it? Because I think the, the question is, you know, should Africa actually be sort of talking more with a unified voice instead of a collection of destinations? Or is, is that actually the best approach to, you know, because each destination is very different, they actually need that singular voice? Or what is your take on this? Yeah, uh, that's true that uh, uh, each destination has its, its own um, uh, I mean, uh, characteristic, uh, but uh, I think it's complementary. Uh, for Madagascar, we mm -hmm. work together with uh, the neighboring islands in the Indian Ocean, yep. like Mauritius, La Reunion, mm -hmm. uh, Comoros, and Mayotte. Uh, so inside uh, a group, an association called Vanilla Island, mm -hmm. uh, where we we make a joint promotion. Mm -hmm. And also we have also uh, a common projects, for example, to, to develop the, the maritime cruises within the Indian Ocean, because uh, up to now, the cruises in Madagascar are only for six months. The six mm. other months are in yeah. the North Hemisphere and the rest in uh, Madagascar. But we do have many assets and uh, uh, tourist attractions in Madagascar uh, and also in the Indian Ocean. So apart from uh, developing the cruises, the maritime cruises in the region, we also develop the cruises all around Madagascar because yep. Madagascar is the, the fourth biggest island in the world with many uh, types of uh, climates and uh, sceneries. Uh, in one island, we, we can have the rainforest and the desert, the national parks. And also, the, the strategy of uh, the government is to, to reach the, the million mark of uh, tourists in 2028. Mm -hmm. And so for that, we uh, try to diversify the offerings, because before, Madagascar was have always been known as uh, a culture or nature destination. But now, we can offer, like for example, uh, tourist, uh, sport tourism, like kite surf, like golf, and many other nautical activities, trekking. Uh, we develop also all luxury hotels. We do have that in Madagascar. Uh, the best one it was constructed uh, during the last decade, as you mm -hmm. told before. But we are uh, developing many uh, categories of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, hotels in Madagascar, from luxuries, upscales, urban, uh, and also mice. So mm. th this is the one of the strategy, but also we are trying also to, to diversify the source market. Because before we used to have people from Europe to come to Madagascar, uh, French people, Italian, German, but now we are looking for other people like mm. from the continental Africa, yeah. from the Middle East, and also from the mm. uh, East European. Yeah. So this is in a nutshell the, yeah. the, the strategy of Madagascar to develop Okay, um, that makes a lot of sense, and I think, obviously, y 
you and I mean, we've heard sort of from a destination point of view, it's sort of expanding and then getting as much access to different source markets. But what are the macros that you're sort of most focused on from a long-term thesis, but also kind of where we find ourselves right now, um, be it, you know, inflation's coming down, but interest rates in Africa could be a bit sticky, right, for, for other reasons. You know, so for the room and for investors thinking about Africa, what are the macros that informed the thesis and what are the macros that you, you kind of uh, really sort of trying to grapple with in the shorter term? When you started the session with regard to population growth, yep. you know, Africa has the youngest and the fastest growing population in the world. You can see geopolitically what's happening right now as India has become the biggest population in the world. You can see what that means with regard to some of the world playing the politics. Mm -hmm. The same is going to happen for Africa. So yep. Africa's becoming a bigger player on the international platform because of what's going to happen by 2050. By 2050, 25% of the population yep. of the world will be in Africa. And then McKinsey's are thinking that that population has the potential to generate three trillion worth of consumer spend. So it's not a, a peasant market, if I can use that word. This is a, a, a youthful, dynamic, very brand orientated, but not just international brands. As, as Michael's mentioned, the, the, there's, we are seeing more of the domestic and the regional mm. markets wanting to buy African brands and comparing those to international brands. So we actually think there'll be more African brands becoming global brands in the future, a bit like what China's tried to do in the past. So I think the, the population growth and the, the age profile of that population, that does two big things. One is it creates a very, a very entrepreneurial and a very diverse um, uh, economy. And also, secondly, it will do one of the fundamental things. It will increase tax take. You know, every country in Africa would tell you the tax take is not great enough. And as we can move through technology, where more of our transactions are trackable, there's mm -hmm. less cash dependency, yep. inevitably governments will increase their tax take. And then second, as I said, because of the population growth. And then the third thing I wouldn't forget, uh, Wayne, is, is land. 45% of the available land on the planet for agriculture is yep. in Africa. Yep. So we all talk about uh, food security. Again, that must be a, a primary motive. And that doesn't just feed into you know, the exports from Africa into the rest of the world. It's also back to Michael's point about connectivity. The fact mm -hmm. that there's more cargo moving, there'll also be more passengers moving. So African we think that there'll be an economic trade benefit. agreements. Exactly. A lot of this policy catching up now, and 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 yeah, but but it is it's I mean it's it's a little bit of a polarizing narrative around this huge con population growth that's coming, and and of course you can pick holes in it and point to some where some of the challenges are, but it's not a homogenous, very good or very bad. You, it, it, but but you cannot deny that that's that demographic dividend because of the profile of age and the growth there and the urbanization, it's going to it's going to drive hotel demand, and it's got to be the, the major thing driving the thesis for anyone looking at it over the next 30 years, and right? And I'll give you an example, Wayne. When, when we bought our second asset in Morocco, we were involved in a competitive process, um, and there was, there was probably a balance between international investors and domestic investors. Ultimately, we were successful because we already had a local knowledge. We really yep. understood how it what the requirements are of regulations in Morocco. It's quite a, a heavy regulatory framework, but it's actually very transparent. So once you understand it, you actually can learn the rules. It's like a football game. Once you know the rules, you can win that game. And we've found that in Morocco. So actually, our international competitors disappeared in that process. Yep. And we were ultimately successful, largely because we had that local knowledge and that foresight. So when we choose markets, we try to look for deep for depth. So if we can see markets where we can establish ourselves and then grow, mm -hmm. it then means that I can effectively stretch that equity I have, not just capital equity, but human equity, of learning how, how those businesses are successful. So then I add more businesses in that platform within that country. A bit like we've tried to do the same in Madagascar. So we've done quite a lot of work to try and understand how does Madagascar work, not just as a leisure destination, to your mm. point, John, but also as a business destination. There's huge opportunity. Yep. We all know about vanilla from Madagascar, but there's lots of other export opportunities mm -hmm. from the country. So we would like to see the opportunity to invest there where we can get both the leisure and the business drivers. Because yep. our hotels, we see them as almost base camp for other investors into those markets.
Absolutely. And, and Michael, kind of building on from that, and, and you're in a sort of unique position because you, you do have a remit and a focus and a growth story in the Middle East. Um, Africa came, came first, I think. So yep. you've seen the two c in parallel. I mean, what, how do you sort of see the differences and uh, the, the story uh, up until this point? Yeah. Look, they are very different mm. uh, for lots of different reasons. Um, but um, th I think where the commonality is, is you, you we're looking for great clients, um, long-term clients, and great locations. And then we need to do an exceptional job with those, with those projects, right? And in terms of looking for those partners, there's no doubt from an investor point of view, um, if we were to go into a market, we're not as fortunate as Westmont with their own kind of cash and balance sheet, right? So we need to partner up. Um, and I think we do see the Middle East as being somewhere that we can, we can, you know, we can yep. mine for those for those investment partners. Um, uh, to date, you know, we've worked with uh, also a lot of the Indian diaspora that that mm -hmm. are in East Africa in yep. particular, who are you know quite globally, you know, mature and and and, and know who we are, yeah, know the franchise model. You exactly. know, know the flexibility that that we can perhaps bring to 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 their projects, um, you know, and so so yes, we see Middle East as quite different to Africa, mm -hmm. but there is some commonality, and I think there is an, an appetite. I mean, just the travel time as well is is, yep. is it makes it makes it you know reasonably straightforward, mm. um, and the fact that the, the 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 wealth of the Middle East. Uh, yep. They want to to to, to spread um, mm. their risks. They want to spread their uh, yep. you know their their, their portfolios. Yeah. So Africa is an obvious place to sure. do it. Um, yeah. And but the transactions need to be of a, sure. of a size. Absolutely. Um, uh, and and probably lastly, uh, and this is with a South Africa hat on of of, of kind of the natural beauty and the animals and the and, and the wildlife. Um, you know, what we've done in, in Africa where we manage some luxury uh, kind of safari product is that's opening doors for us here in the yes. Middle East where the Middle East is now looking from the urban I into, exactly. the, into yeah. the desert and trying to yeah. get into the, the kind of, you know, yep, you absolutely. know not the safari business, but that certainly the, mm. uh, the, the, the experiences that you can get out in the desert. And in the yeah, in I the mean, that's obviously pretty central in that a lot of that natural product and beauty, you, you, you can't recreate. I mean, yes, you can take a lodge concept to a desert sort of setting, but it's a different sort of product. So, I mean, I think that's really sort of what Africa has. If we look at the Indian Ocean, especially as a resort destination, Jahari, and just to, to close on with your side, uh, you know, um, I, I mean, just that proximity to, we talked about the Africa growth story, but obviously India, China, and the amount of population that, you know, lives within that uh, well, it's more than 50% of the world that, that live within a sh relatively short flight to the Indian Ocean. I mean, how much of that is, is, is driving the opportunity for uh, Madagascar going forward? Yeah, actually, as I told you before, uh, we want to, to, to open to new source market. And uh, for that, we work together with... Uh, uh, airport managers, like uh, the one, the new one in the capital of Madagascar, to try to attract new airline company to come to Madagascar. Uh, because the, the, pro yeah, the, the, the problem of Madagascar before was the, the access, aer aerial access as an island, we, 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 we had that mm. problem. But now we are linked to the world through many uh, airline companies, and we are trying also to, to get more. Uh, for example, in our strategy, we, we want to, to, to open the market to, to India or to, 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 to China. Uh, we, because the port of uh, tourist arrival tourists in Madagascar is very a little bit small from Asia, but we know that th there is a big opportunity from there. So that's why we are looking yeah. to, to, to mm. develop uh, 
this uh, yeah. this market. Okay, yep. great. And 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 probably just in closing, because we're nearly out of time. But you and in terms of you know accessing finance and and attracting capital. I mean, what is the the sort of message to the room around where the opportunity is? I mean, obviously, a lot of hotels in Africa are sitting in a situation where they're struggling to raise capital locally. Um, whether that's their broader balance sheet outside of a sort of property fundamentals or whatever the case is, you know, what opportunity does that now present to investors globally and what, what is the message around that? I, I <coughs> in the last 10 years, as an industry, we've probably been very distracted by new build. Yeah. So whenever people have talked about projects, it tends yeah. to be we're building something new. Yeah. Um, I think partly because of the cost of capital yep. and the fact that so many of those projects have run late, the, 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 the return thesis is, is hard to justify. Mm -hmm. So I would say now that there is a, a growing, the gravity, if you like, is towards conversions and recycling those assets. There is a lot of assets in the continent. You know, across yep. the 54 countries, there There's is a lot. There's more hotels, rooms in Africa than there are in the Middle East. That's a very good today. point. Very good point, <laughs> Wayne. Um, so if, if we can get the financial, particularly the debt providers, to understand conversions, and I would say that increasingly that's the case, the development banks are increasingly moving away from traditional green fields to look at refurbishments, and that might seem obvious, but even just the argument about recycling, you know, the carbon capture and the existing mm. structure rather than recreating new has actually, from World Bank's perspective, has woken them up to the fact that, yeah, we should be supporting more regenerate, more revitalizations and mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. renovations. So I think that's the, the key thing for me is alignment. Make yep. sure you have got a local player who understands how to operate and how to, yep. how to deliver in that local market. I think you're right, Michael, we've got a certain advantage on equity and the fact that that alignment is really important when you're asking somebody else to take risk. And then thirdly, I think the building industry have to stop selling us these stories about it's really cost effective to build and actually try to put more capital into, into refurbishments. So that would be my three suggestions. Couldn't, ag couldn't agree more. So absolutely, you heard it's um, lots of opportunities, but the right opportunities on the right street corner is, is really sort of what, the, what, what we the message we need to take to the wider investment community. But thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining. And uh, thank you very much for, for having us today. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you.